Uh, I'd like to introduce to you Becca McRae, our uh, president-elect for VSSNA, who has spent so much time and energy putting this together. Thank you, Becca. Hi, everyone. Um, we do just, we have one more minute until we officially start. Um, so thank you for being here. And I'm actually going to pause and wait the minute so that we have everyone on board and we'll start on time. And this is Clayton Wetzel, webmaster. We are at 100. So we, everyone that can be in is on now. Oh, okay. Then I'll just, I'll go. And we're recording, right? Live? Yes. Okay. Thank you all for coming. We had a great response to the Google Form invitation, which actually generated too many questions to answer in an hour's time. VSSNA's executive committee did our best to complete a list of the most asked questions to be addressed today. Today's town meeting will feel more like a presentation than a true town meeting, but we will try to answer questions as people type them into the chat box. To access the chat box, please click on the lower part of your screen and click on the chat option. There you can post your question so anyone can see it. We will then add these questions to the presentation. We recognize that some school nurses will not be able to attend the recording today with the, and we have done that in, uh, with the intent to post it to our website as a resource for all Vermont school nurses. Today's agenda includes a presentation by Sharon Lee Treffrey, Vermont State School Nurse Consultant at the Vermont Department of Health. Sharon Lee will discuss the role of the school nurse as well as the most up-to-date information on COVID-19 from the health department's perspective. Please type questions as they come up in the chat box. Once Sharon Lee is finished with her presentation, she will then address as many of the questions submitted through the Google form as time allows. Thank you, Sharon Lee, for joining us today. Thank you, Becca. Uh, hi there to everyone. And thank you so much for inviting me to this town hall meeting. We're all in this together, working desperately to keep up with the constant demands of this evolving new world. So I'm really grateful for this chance for collaboration. As you know, public health nurses have been working 24 seven with epidemiology, emergency management systems and the public. I don't know about you, but I've been a little feeling a little overwhelmed and a little unconnected to the direct work, crucial work of school nurses. Um, but there's no better time, and excuse me, I am getting constant email uh, coming into my notes. So uh, be patient. There's really no better time to highlight the value of our professional organization. This is absolutely where the rubber hits the road. And I'm so grateful to the VSSNA leadership for this opportunity. They worked really hard. Um, you know, you know a lot of this stuff, but the coronaviruses are named for those little crown like spikes that you see on the picture. Um, I tried to find some other interesting pretty colors, but what I discovered was that the coronaviruses have been identified since the 60s. Um, nothing new, there's seven that can infect people, but you know this. Um, and what I understand from our behavioral objective for today is to make this platform specifically for you as school nurses or for us as school nurses, so we can try to be together on the same page and Excuse me, I'm getting all these emails. Um, and to correct misinformation and share ideas about the role of the school nurse. I've adapted some of these slides from Dr. Brina Holmes. She's a pediatrician and she is my maternal and child health division director at the health department. And I've added a lot of my own. Um, I am familiar with the work of the Future of Nursing 2030 and the national town halls that were done across the nation. Um, so I understand some of the process and our, and our goal for this to be somewhat interactive. Um, those were highly structured meetings. And, but, so I'm not wedded to all of the content in the slides. Um, and they, the SSNA, SOAP and all are going to push me off um, the soapbox if time gets tight. So, um, 
Clayton, please move to the next one that says thank you. And some of you are now used to the moment. This is Clayton. If you could be a little closer to your microphone, I think it would be easier for folks to hear you. Uh, we had a request for that, please. Thank you. So I'm trying to put my notes. I'm looking off side from the microphone. Let me move that because my notes are at the side on another computer. Um, is this a little better? So some of you are now used to the moments that I take at the beginning of presentations, meetings, and speaking. Um, this is, self-care is crucial now more than ever. Um, so I'm gonna invite you to take three deep breaths in through your nose and out through your mouth. You're welcome to close your eyes. Let these breaths bring you back to this space, wherever you are, to your spirit and your zest for life, to these colleagues and to this topic so that you're ready to use your nursing superpowers. Uh, next slide, please. So you all know this. You've been seeing it for, well, some of you have been seeing it for a good four years or so. Our role of school nursing during um, COVID-19 leans nicely and fits into the framework for 21st century school nursing practice. Care coordination, leadership, community and public health, um, continuous improvement and standards of practice. There's been some awesome stories of those of you who are already using your critical thinking and really jumping into this whole process um, of COVID-19. And I, I want to share that because you, I really am grateful for things that you're doing now and that I know you're going to be doing through the next months ahead. Um, care coordination, school nurses have been ensuring that medication and supplies for students' healthcare needs have been getting back to their homes. ADHD medication, diabetes equipment, epinephrine, auto injectors. Um, in Kingdom East, I heard that their LEA are, were doing such great um, school nurses were doing interdisciplinary collaboration with others to reach out to children and their families at home. Um, it was going so well that uh, maybe a couple of families were heard to say, oh, this is great, but hold off. <laughs> um, so they were really connected. Um, the Essex Westford School District has been working with their food service directors and helping them learn how to use their system for bringing volunteers into the school, their current system, and how the school nurses vetted them for health and safety background checks um, and use a, a short sl six slide resource on hand washing, infection prevention, and how to put um, the gloves on the, the uh, food food service gloves on and off, um, and how to help them learn that masks were for frontline healthcare workers in the hospital in ED. Um, President So Paul in her uh, leadership role was, I had helped the VSSNA to send a letter to Dr. Mark Levine, Commissioner of Health, um, Secretary French, AOE, and Governor Scott advocating for the use of school nurses in their full license capacity. Um, community public health, uh, school nurses are reaching out to the American Red Cross to set up self-isolation housing in the schools um, so the health workers can protect their families while they wait out their 14-day quarantine. Um, and there's an old story from Tropical Storm I Irene uh, when um, Jeanette Toro Linehan, uh, a school nurse in Southern Vermont, set up an American Red Cross center and, um, and health care center during that time. So these are all things that school nurses are doing. Uh, President-elect uh, Rebecca McRae um, is getting school nurses together in the Burlington School District to update health policies and procedures, for example, um, and helping to train a school personnel on doing daily check-ins for child care visits as some of their procedures that they're spelling out. Um, standards of practice. Some of you have studied the, the crisis standard of care that is in place during a declaration of emergency, but that only means that 
we really need to know our scope and standard of our scope of practice. Um, and, but we'll come back to that later in this message. Um, and those of you who are acting as trusted healthcare personnel right from the beginning, North Country Supervisory Union, um, school nurses were presenting, uh, preventing, uh, protecting kids from bullying um, around COVID-19. Dummerston, school nurse, um, her superintendent uses her as the uh, COVID-19 expert that she is um, on a regular basis for each of Dr. for guidance. The Mattery school nurse um, has works with their staff to inform them using the health department content about COVID-19, but avoids doing, providing medical advice um, and working with her staff to know when they need to go to their healthcare provider. Um, and I just received a link from the Colchester School Nurses from the Journal of American Medicine, Medical Association about finding new sources for PPE um, which I threw in here early in the morning. Um, so you'll see that later. Um, we'll get to that later. Okay, next slide, please. And images are powerful. I really like the pretty pink one, but this is actually a picture because I like the colors. Uh, it's a picture of antibodies from the MERS, um, Middle East uh, Respiratory Syndrome outbreak years, a few years back. And I think the image of the concept of of nurses as antibodies, we can be the antibodies or the bodies that we need to mitigate this current misinformation, um, to mitigate this disease and to develop a response needed. Um, and, and you are definitely the boots on the ground that will be needed when we get into the recovery phase of what we're doing. Um, the next slide, you can move forward, um, is to get us on the same page, correct information, um, we're gonna start with a situational update. Um, the situational update is something that we do every day and the using incident command process um, at the health department. Um, but this information is available to you on the website, um, the health department website. Um, I'm going to touch a little bit on the structure that the state uses to respond to COVID-19, a little bit of the maternal and child health division goals, the role of school nursing, and I, I want to remind you to please keep in touch. Um, keep reaching out. My phone number and email and um, Dr. Lena Holmes using the Health Department website and even 211 when you're looking for community resources. So here's, you're looking at the situational update. And I've got to move my slides. Um, it's a part of the structure that government entities use to provide consistent communication to all members of a quote situation. That structure has codes, divisions, branches, acronyms, and can be expanded or contracted quickly. Um, I'd, ur I'd urge some of you to study the incident command system. And all of you, and thank you for those military who served in the military, are very aware, familiar with what incident command is about. Um, this process has been around, actually, national preparedness since the 1800s. Um, as of, so we're looking at the data, um, that is uh, yesterday. Um, don't put a lot of stock in the fact that you see Chittenden County as a hot spot that is likely to be reflecting the capacity of testing. It doesn't mean that there is a disease in the rest of the counties. Um, so it's counting the numbers of data that we know for people who've been tested um, and who then show up with the disease, but it doesn't mean that the disease is stuck in Chittenden County. Um, as of the 27th, so was that Saturday, um, there were only 17 people in the hospital. And this morning at report, there was only um, 19 people in the hospital in Vermont in seven hospitals um, across the state with COVID-19, meaning that the majority of these people are self-treating and in self-isolation at home or off-site. Um, next slide, please. So again, these are a bunch of numbers. Um, about 9% of the tests show someone who's positive for COVID-19. This again um, is on the health department website and is updated daily at one o'clock. 
the vast majority of test are testing positive for other things like RSV, respiratory syncytial uh, virus, um, a common respiratory virus that usually causes mild cold-like symptoms, um, or the flu um, and the other coronaviruses. So they're still testing for the other coronaviruses as well. Um, the study from North Korea confirms that children are least likely to get uh, COVID-19. And we know this because they screened everyone with tests for COVID-19, whereas um, our capacity in the United States in Vermont does not allow us to test all children. Um, so we do know that children are less at risk for some reason. Um, next slide, please. So we're at a critical juncture. Um, there's been a change in the testing access, and all of you probably know this, um, as of the 27th. Um, healthcare providers are encouraged to proceed in order um, to order testing for anyone symptomatic, and it says adult, um, for whom they believe is infected with the correct term for COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, as when they suspect that that is their reasonable re possibility. Individuals must go to their uh, medical provider by phone um, to obtain a referral for testing and to be told where, which testing site to show up to. So people don't just go there if they think they're sick. Um, remember that other slide, most people are sick with other things. Um, and the other change is that the health department will now be the direct notifier of patients with um, COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. Um, that is a change from a couple from last week when um, the anyone who had a test had to go to their ordering physician. Even if you were a health care provider, the physician that ordered the test for you was the one who had to give you the result. That has is the change. Um, okay, next slide, please. And so, let's see, for those, I think I just, oh, so for someone who's testing positive, the health department will call the patient. Um, they'll provide education on how to protect themselves and those in their immediate family or household. And then they're gonna elicit information regarding recent high-risk activity, such exposure to vulnerable populations. Um, if they're you know, working in a jail, if they're taking care of elderly, those of us <clears throat> 65 and older, <laughs> um, or 60 and older, depending on your underlying health conditions. Um, for example, if, yeah. So the health department will make that determination and that individual, if they're not working in high risk situations, if they're working at Walmart, for example, and they're outside of the six foot uh, social isolation guidance, um, the fact that they may have COVID-19 does not require they, um, that the whole facility be shut down or even beyond that person's work site be clean. Now, if that person's working everywhere, yes, there's guidance for businesses on how to handle those things. It doesn't mean that everyone in their department needs to know that they have COVID-19. The instructions the guide will help that individual to identify who they need to tell. If they are working with vulnerable people, and very likely many are trying to work because that's a huge issue, um, they may, then the health department, if, they, if the person ill identify somebody who's 70, then the health department will contact that person because they are a vulnerable individual and they will get strict instructions. Um, please share your questions on this. We're gonna we'll go to the next slide. And I've been talking off of my slides. So this is a little bit to remind you that we are going to be getting, moving into a recovery phase at some point. Um, that's ahead of us. Uh, 
Um, the one thing that's important during this mitigation phase about injury prevention, you all know kids are home with less supervision than is ideal. They're, those issues have already shown up in the hospital, one in intensive care and one in the, in, in the emergency department. So we know that injury prevention is a crucial issue. Next slide, please. Um, so you all get this again, this is we're going to lean on the specifics of our framework for guiding. It doesn't matter whether schools open or closed. These are the function. These are our functions. Whether you do it from your desk or from your school office or on the phone with your superintendent. These roles still apply. Uh, next slide, please. So there is a little bit of an elephant in the room. Um, and we will, there'll be time to discuss this. Um, you see the little bunny here. Um, those are not personal protective devices, equipment. There's another picture that's um, this cute little picture with these four women um, wearing lovely cloth masks. Those are not considered personal protective equipment. Um, you'll see the, a citation here. This is the one that came in last night. Um, was just published yesterday or the other day. Um, so that is a really good resource. We'll get to that later. Next slide, please. So I'm going to focus on, um, as school nurses, our greatest responsibility in community and public health is risk reduction because by and large, we are working with a healthy population or trying to protect healthy people. I know some of you here wear multiple hats, and some of you know that I spend several days a month caring for my parents who are in the mid-90s, um, who survived the depression and have lots to teach me about this process. Um, and I've been doing that for over a year. So we're all wearing multiple hats, but risk reduction with um, correct information, health education, and thinking in the big picture um, is, our, is a big focus. Surveillance, we'll talk about that later during Q&A. Okay, next slide, please. So I am assuming that most of you are on the computer. Um, and by seeing all your names that I can see so far, I can tell it's computer and not phone. I'm gonna give you a full minute. I want you to read this, please. And I'm setting my timer for one minute. I, I see the question of what is a long time. Um, we can discuss that later in the, uh, hopefully my timer won't reach. Oops, sorry, don't know how to turn that off. I thought I was figuring that out. Um, we'll talk about that later. Okay, next slide, please. Um, care coordination occurs whether, again, whether you're in school or out of school, um, let's move forward to the next slide, please. Hopefully you've got medications and supplies sent home, work with your nurses in the LEA, figure out who is high priority. Next slide, please. Okay, this is one where we'll spend a little bit more time on. Um, and then I want you to read the next uh, note from the Board of Nursing. Uh, you know that in Vermont, we don't have a separate document that is called the Nurse Practice Act. Um, you just go to the Board of Nursing website, get to the nursing part, and look at the thing that says rules. 
and click on there and it will take you right to the statute that um, the legal document that explains explains our nurse practice what many call the nurse practice act. Um, next slide please. So is it easier for me to read or for you to read? Um, those of you who can. Maybe if you read it, Sharon Lee, it might be better. Thank you. Um, so knowing that the crisis standards of care is a national document, this is the Vermont version. Um, what that means is that well, it's, uh, it's a strategy for scarce resource situations, and it may become an important reference for all clinical providers if the state exhausts critical resources. Um, you can guess that it says a whole lot about school nursing, right? Not. Um, so I wrote to the Board of Nursing and the Secretary of State's office, and this is the response um, from Gabe Gilman. Um, so pursuant to the executive order, the first one um, on the 120, uh, section 5, 15 and 16 of statute, Governor Scott has ordered that relevant rules governing medical services shall be suspended to the extent necessary to permit such personnel to provide paramedicine transportation to destinations, including hospitals and places other than hospitals or healthcare facilities, telemedicine. I don't know if any of you have had one. I had my first telemedicine visit just before this meeting um, to facilitate treatment of patients in place and such other services as may be approved by the Commission of Health. Relevant rules governing nursing services shall be suspended to the extent necessary to permit such personnel to provide medical care, including but not limited to administration of medicine, prescribing of medicine, telemedicine to facilitate treatment of patients in place, and such other services may be approved by the Secretary of State in consultation with the Commissioner of Health. Um, without getting into all of the details related to this, um, when you click on that blue link under Executive Order uh, 01, you don't have to do it now, but on your free time, um, which hopefully some of you have a little bit of, um, you will see dates. And so, you know, just keep that in mind. Um, first, you have to know your, your scope of practice. And then if, you're, if you need or there is request to put a chest tube in the middle of somebody, uh, in somebody in the middle of uh, Walmart, that doesn't fit into anyone's scope of practice. And there's no need for that. But if you're asked to do something above and beyond your nursing license, um, in your uh, in carrying out your school nursing or your other RN duties, you may be asked to. If you but you will you as the one responsible for your scope need to know is that something that you have experienced before? Do you have any idea about the anatomy and the proper position and the proper sanitation and PPEs and all of those things. Are you, are you competent to do that? And if not, how do you gain the competency in that situation? Um, so it's that critical thinking that's needed based on what you know of your scope and what you need to learn to provide safe care. Next slide, please. So the lifelong learner, this leadership piece, um, all of us as lifelong learners, um, I feel that that's critical because, again, it's back to what, um, and you can move to the next slide, um, is using evidence-based sources. So when I talked about um, PPE, for example, this I highly recommend. This is an hour. Um, this link is free. It should be available to any of you. Um, and um, Again, this is the advantage to membership in these organizations because we, we get these, I get these uh, communications directly, but um, this is made available for public use for obvious reasons during this time. But this is, I highly recommend the um, uh, be confident protecting yourself and providing best care to your patients during this pandemic. Um, 
it, I like the hard science of it. It's not just microbiology, but of course, nursing science. They do a nice job explaining studies on how decisions are made about the spread of COVID-19 and um, past infectious disease studies on under-resourced facilities and safe ways to reuse some supplies like N95 respirators and what is considered PPEs. Um, it's moderated by Cheryl Peterson, Vice President of Nursing Practice at ANA, and presented by Dr. Terry Redman. Um, and I don't remember her, the facility, and also facilitated by Kendra McMillan from all from RNs from ANA. Um, you will be getting a copy of these slides. Incident command, I mentioned to anyone who wants to be able to, it, I'm beginning to think that maybe this should be incident command. There's four or five levels and um, at the health department, we're required to do the first two levels. I'm thinking that um, it would be reasonable to require all nurses, all RNs um, in school nursing to do at least the level one incident command training. They are all free and online. Um, next slide. So there's a whole lot we don't know, um, but we all love nurses and school nurses. This is a link and don't play it now, but it's, it will make you cry. It's about four minutes of Billy Joe playing um, a tribute to a nurse. And if you've heard it, it's beautiful. So we can go to the next slide. Um, Questions and answers. The next, my next two slides are just the resources. Um, and these are my contact information. These are the public health nurses that are answering the hotline. Um, you have some, when you call in, you'll have some things, you know, to choose from. And um, we're responding primarily to child care. And so I know that's where a lot of the questions will come. Um, but there are guidance for uh, child care workers. We have met with child care providers, child care administrators, and um, food and nutrition program personnel across the state of Vermont and provided the health guidance. Um, the health guidance, uh, if it's not in, it's, it's on the health department website, so I can, we can go to the website and I can show you exactly where to find answers to 90% of your questions. Um, I'll be quiet. <laughs> All right, the definition of a long time. So it depends on the situation. A long time, if you are an intimate partner or you, a household member, that's a long time. If you're sitting in a meeting, three feet from your colleague and your colleague tests uh, ill, positive for COVID-19, um, and you're there for the day, that might be a long time. If you're there filling out an application for 20 minutes, that's not a long time. School nurse role, school nurse role at the time of school closure. What tasks? So the tasks fall under the framework. So any one of those framework pieces you should be focusing on. Um, common tasks are updating your medical records, your immunizations, um, getting being prepared, your students with special health needs. I mean, my priority would be the care coordination. Getting a list of what your the kids need in your LEA or your district, your school, um, what are your, your the, so the, the question has come up, well, making a list. Well, this is not a list you're distributing to anyone. This is a list you are using for your nursing intervention. So if you have a list with 40 names on it and it doesn't go anywhere and you've got, you know, 10 of them have asthma and then you have a whole list of other things, that's your note, those are your notes. Um, so have you set up uh, virtual meetings with these families? Have you met with your school uh, student support team, guidance and special education? Um, you're, have you done your interdisciplinary collaboration to find out what's the best way to serve these families? 
and what resources do they need and have they you know if they, are they food insecure are they housing insecure um, do you know how to use 211 and refer them there um, a lot of you know that your churches have food shelves and little free pantries and um, how to connect families to childcare if they're essential workers and payment for this and getting people to, you know, you can send a lot of those people to um, 211 for um, workers' comp questions and being laid off under resourced families. Health surveillance, great, thank you. So health surveillance and illness. Um, the last time I looked at one of the charts used for health surveillance, um, it was pretty detailed. Who has time to do that and what, of what value is it? What do you need to know in your health surveillance? Do you need to know that um, most of the disease in your community is influenza? Do you need to know that a lot of kids are getting RSV? or just have a cold? Or do you need to know that seven of your staff members have been tested positive for COVID-19 for reasons that don't even relate to school? Um, that's that um, telemedicine. Now, uh, so I hope I answered this surveillance question and just post more questions if that's unclear. So that's really, you have to decide what is the data most useful for you and for your school administration and for getting people back into school. An official role about telemedicine. I think we've just answered it in the um, message from the Secretary of State. Um, we're under a declaration of a state of emergency. So uh, nobody's, going to, nobody's going to make an official statement um, because we're too busy capturing and taking, being sure that people are protecting the most vulnerable in the community. So again, know your scope. What are you, do you feel confident to do? If you feel confident that you can talk to a, a family on the phone or virtually, and you can document things confidentially and know that it won't get eaten by the dog or shared, you know, picked up in your husband's um, duffel bag as they go off to drive truck for delivery of masks um, or fuel assistance or something like that. Um, those are the, that's your critical thinking that you have to make that decision as to the best way to protect confidentiality. Because we've been given free reign. Vision and hearing, it's a face-to-face -face activity. I don't think we're doing it. Not to worry. Are teachers defined under the governor's rule as an essential function? Um, so, to, are teachers defined? So again, that is all in the governor's orders. And um, if you, when you want to take time during this meeting, and I'm not watching the clock anymore, um, we can go on the website and find that. But there is a specific list of essential function. I believe teachers have been considered essential workers. Should teachers be going on site during the emergency order? Why would they not go on site? Um, we, I go on site, um, even though my doctor just told me not to, but, um, and we're supposed to be working at home as much as possible, but um, are ill people, the question is, are sick people staying home? Are they self-isolating for any reason? This is cold and flu season. Um, are they washing their hands? Are the high touch areas being washed? Um, we're being, and the next thing says, we are being asked to help with the system to allow teachers limited access to school property and is a wonderful to be part of the solution. Pondering why teachers should have access at this time when the governor lifts the emergency order. So access, because um, there is a huge demand from the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Education to the state education agency, so in this case, Secretary French, who says, thou shalt ensure distance learning. Um, well, thou can't ensure anything if thou doesn't have access to the, you know, the, your materials in your curriculum. So it's a challenge. It's a challenge every single one of us is going through. 
Um, but again, healthy people doing healthy things is the way to keep and keep that six foot social distance, uh, physical distance. Um, Sharon Lee, this is Clayton. Uh, I just want to add that uh, the VSSNA has put together a list of all of the directives that are associated with the executive order from uh, Governor Scott. And it's um, on the VSSNA page underneath the COVID-19, and it's the very last bullet um, on that page at the very bottom. That'll give, uh, if folks are trying to research it, I tried to put it in a in date sequence. Um, right. Some stuff supersedes other things, but as best as I could, I've kind of done it from a, a linear standpoint to see which, uh, which things are um, effective and, um, and so people have a place to start with the research. That's a lot of critical thinking. Thank you very, very much for that. We look forward to it as well. Um, if we do start a process, we can go back, I think, time-wise. Um, should it be similar or structured the same for all schools to ensure we are doing the same, looking in the same direction as public health? Um, if you know one school, you know one school, and that is true across the country. Um, you know, most school systems are designed by local dollars and local governance. Um, it would be nice in some way, but it won't happen in Vermont. Um, Five hundred four. So that's a great question. Um, yes, they're due. I would, you know, make every effort to do that if you can, if you have the time and the virtual capacity, and you can get, you know, read over the plan, decide what, who are the most essential people. Figure out, you know, this is a great time to talk to the family. Um, I'm not sure what you mean do. Uh, again, that may be dependent on your school's system, but um, they are required to be reviewed yearly. Um, the executive order that we referenced for the state of Vermont is also um, the U.S. Department of Education. And for a while, I had that link on my uh, signature for email. But... Um, Documents came out, I don't know, Thursday or Friday, Clayton and I were talking about it, um, that get into this, but I'm, you know, I can, I'm pretty sure, and I will be reading those documents to find out. Um, so so sure, um, Sharon Lee, if this helps, um, uh, when, we, when we do a print of this uh, PowerPoint presentation, um, underneath of this slide, there will be four links that have to do with special education, although I couldn't find 504 specifically. Um, it does address IEPs, and um, we may be able to extrapolate to figure out the 504 requirements. Um, just, so that remember that, just remember that 504 is actually the bigger umbrella where special education sits underneath that. Okay. Um, um, so, But those links are available for folks to be able to, to look at that, too. Excellent. Superintendents could receive a written notice from the Department of Health, um, all of the appropriate tasks. I, yep, that would be nice, but then that would be a non-nurse directing RNs and nobody can direct RN practice except RNs. Um, so when a contract says and other duties as necessary, um, that's, where you have to work out what is the best use of your time. And if we haven't even, I don't, we haven't gotten to this, but I know some of you have jobs in healthcare facilities and you don't have the option to be available during this time. So um, that's something that I know others have worked, are working on as well. Help a community as an RN fulfilling the role of the school nurse release time for school nurses to accomplish this. So I shared a lot of stories in the beginning um, because people are doing wonderful things. There's a, um, you know, American Red Cross, uh, Medical Reserve Corps, those are perfect roles for school nurses in the community. Sharon Lee, I would just add um, the second part of that question, have the districts released time for this? Uh, so the VSSNA has reached out to the Vermont NEA and is also reaching out to the Superintendent's Association to discuss 
any nurse that falls underneath of a teacher contract as a uh, licensed um, teacher endorsed in school nursing or associate school nursing um, and how if they were to work during their normal time when they're supposed to be at work although we're working from home um, how that what it would affect in each contract and what the requirements would be so we can get something a lot a lot of folks are having questions about I'm being it's being reached out from a hospital for us to work since we're not working well we're working remotely and if we have a contract we're responsible to that contract so we're going to try to get um, if we can get any guidance, we're going to do our best to get guidance for everybody. Um, and I don't know the, um, how that's going to be sent out, but SOF is working on that. Uh, the president is working on that now. And we'll have more on that topic uh, later this week. The schools are open in the fall. Can we assume that COVID-19, yes, will be active? What guidance will they give us about N95 fit testing for our staff? Um, we're not there yet. It, until there's a vaccine and until there's herd immunity, we've got COVID-19. Medications back to families. Call them up and find out how they'd like to do it. Child care centers. This is a great, you are, you can be the COVID-19 expert, information expert, learn how to use the health department website. Um, there's lots of information there. Uh, you, it takes practice. I mean, I have to dig around and it changes. So it means getting on that website every day. What I can um, show, and I don't know where if it's in your notes, but there is a very specific document about um, child care centers. Um, they are to do daily health screenings. Anyone can take a temperature. Um, the school nurse is the perfect one to teach people how to do that, how to teach prevention, uh, in infection prevention, um, and helping families understand or providers understand or teachers understand that the kid with asthma that's well controlled, um, that doesn't have uh, a cough, um, or even if maybe they do have a cough, an occasional cough, but it's a regular part of their, their health condition, it's okay for them to be in the child care. What, you know, what you're looking for is something new. Um, you know, all of a sudden the kid is coughing every day, you know, all very frequently. Um, so ill people need to be home. That's all that guidance and in interpreting that document. Uh, is it correct that people over 60 should not be providing direct care? And that um, has been discussed ad nauseum with um, but not out on so that you would see it. Yes, everyone has those connections, half of the workforce. And probably half, some of us, a lot, well, lots of us, some of us are well over that. So um, that is the rule, 60. And because, you know, I think perhaps because they're just that much closer to people who are sick. So if you're 60, and you've got a kid with just a runny nose and a low grade temperature, it's probably not COVID-19, but it's a cold and you at 60 don't need to get a cold and then be at risk for getting later getting COVID-19. So that's been hard to work around that. Some providers are take, biting the bullet and sure providing care anyway in their own home. Uh, school exclusion for fever and cough. So that is on the health department website. And we have uh, expanded that. Um, and childcare in particular, you know, you're apt to be talking about, even though the two-year-olds are not necessarily in the school center, there are two-year-olds, so language is written for childcare group um, as a group. Um, and so it was moved to 72 hours, seizure uh, fever free is the rule for exclusion. Fever free, of course, without medication. Health of individuals on a daily basis, that's up to you and your uh, district. Um, why would you need to be doing that? Um, do you need to check temperatures? Um, it looks, I see somebody quoted the 
document, excellent. So conduct a daily health check, ask children and staff, have you been in close contact with someone? Have you felt unwell with respiratory symptoms? Have you had a cough, high temperature, shortness of breath, breathing difficulty? Consider screening children and employees. So it's not a consider, thou shalt. Um, and a child care can, provider can do that. It doesn't need to be the nurse um, at the beginning when they arrive each day. Temperature set at 100.4 when they should be as the cutoff to be sent home. And you all know all the reasons where why temperatures vary. Um, yep, and he's highlighted the 72 hours. Um, anyone diagnosed with COVID-19 should remain isolated until three days or 72 hours have passed and it's recovery defined as a resolution of fever without the use of fever reducing medication. Um, and at least seven days have passed um, since symptoms first appeared, whichever is longer. If symptoms begin while the childcare facility, should, they should be sent home as soon as possible. And just remember, 91% of those illnesses are something besides COVID-19. Um, the so I would do childcare for 10 years, and it's no easy job. Checking, keeping kids in separate spaces, volunteers. No volunteers are allowed. I mean, no visitors are allowed. Um, and I don't know what you mean volunteer. Um, it, it would be as if you're talking about child care facilities, they're paid. If you're talking about schools, they may perhaps volunteer from your paid teacher staff. Um, children playing in the same space, playing with the same toys. Um, it's unavoidable. The Christ, the healthcare workers absolutely need to have someone to keep their kids safe. Um, all of the other essential workers, you know, you can't get your, your N95 uh, respirators delivered if you don't have people driving trucks and delivering fuel and things like that, um, or being in the nutrition program at the hospital or custodial services are more important than ever. So that's why the 10 people rule, um, keeping the group small, washing toys, and washing bathrooms between use. If you have toddlers using a bathroom, um, it should be wiped. The places where they use should be wiped before the next kid comes in is the ideal. Um, and I know that that's hard to do. Like I said, I did, did that. <laughs> So Sharon Lee, uh, it's Clayton again. And um, on March 22nd, there was health guidance for childcare in schools providing childcare for essential persons. And yeah. that document, uh, I, I believe it's that document that actually goes into detail about less than 10, including the teachers. Um, yeah. not, all, all of the stuff you talked about is all in that. And that's on that COVID um, directive list I was talking about. Yep, yeah, and that's all on the health department website. Thank you. Nurses who are taking care of these students who have not been tested and are asymptomatic. Um, so the PPEs, your masks, PPE, surgical masks, gowns and gloves, and N95 respirators, facial shields, the whole uh, suits for those who are doing high touch care are all reserved for people who are expecting ill people. There's no, no recommendation or any value, there's no value to wearing masks um, otherwise. Will there be guidelines regarding protocols for, oh, sure, yeah. Sharon Lee, we have five minutes left, just so you know. Thank you. Um, do you guys, maybe one of you could look at the pictures and um, the questions and kind of choose some priorities? Or maybe just open it up if or things. I think we'll just have a couple more questions and then we'll close it. Uh, I do want to be respectful of people's time. Um, and we have already um, uh, dedicated ourselves to uh, posting questions. Uh, answers to all of the questions on the website, whether they're answered or not in live in person. This is a great question. Um, 
for children coming to the center, have you been in close contact with a person who is known to have COVID-19? Um, if the mother or father is a nurse or a healthcare worker who is caring for COVID-19, can we still care for their children? Um, that is not entirely clear what uh, guidance I gave this morning is um, a person who will be involved in the testing. Well, if you are testing appropriately, you are wearing PPE. And so you are not coming in contact with COVID-19. And so you as that healthcare person doing the testing in that example, if your partner can do the drop off and pick up of your children from childcare, that is the best scenario. Uh, there is requiring families to provide documentation that they are essential workers and indeed working. Um, no. There may be more specifics on that, but right now, you all know how many people it takes to care and feed an elephant or any of these functions in healthcare. Um, and even in the community, again, you know, talking about somebody at the gas station, people are essential for different reasons. This is, if you think of the role of the person, is it essential for, the, for them to be employed to keep the state safe? So are they a state trooper? Are they a um, communications person? Are they military? You know, all of those people are considered essential. And Sharon Lee, on the bottom of that slide, when they get this, uh, it actually has the legal definition from the state standpoint, who, who is um, essential personnel. Um, yep. And so those two links uh, will give them, if somebody had a question, it tells you specifically who's covered. Yep, I think the 26 um, got a little bit, teeny bit tighter, that document, the second one that you listed. Require responsibilities about child care centers. Is it mandatory? I again, those are those are appropriate roles. There's so much education if you're providing correct information and correcting misinformation. There's such an important role in um, your in your work. Um, if you are, on the other hand, responsible for children, your own children, or a vulnerable adult and you cannot be in the public, then you can't, shouldn't be out in the community. Um, but if you have the capacity and the help and the understanding of COVID-19, what better way to serve your community than to share your nursing expertise? This is your nursing superpowers, your critical thinking. Um, that's why those resources around um, PPE from the ANA and the other one from the Journal of American Medical Association would be really beneficial to read. It gives you practice in this, these words. Anyway, to help the health department. Yes, stay Thank informed. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, Sharon Lee, we're running out of time, but thank you so much for um, sharing your expertise with us today. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming as well, for joining us. If you're not already a member of NASA or VSSNA, we'd, uh, we'd just like you to consider joining so that you can stay as informed as possible on all of this new information as it emerges. We'd also like you to invite, um, we'd like to invite any volunteers that would like to help research actions that school nurses in other states are taking around COVID-19. Um, again, this, is, this meeting has been recorded and all of the typed notes as well as the recording will be available on uh, vssna.org for reference. We will also be posting answers to all of the questions submitted via Google Forms, whether or not they were answered within the past hour. So please email any volunteer interests or questions that may arise to COVID-19 at vssna.org. We do hope to have another town meeting again soon, and our meeting is now adjourned. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you all so much.
Thank you, Sharon Lee.